the logic of my paper has three parts. One is to spell out goals for a world which is multipolar. And the goals will fix, as usual, about on 2050. Now, the goals will be ambitious. So the second part of the paper is to look 40 years back and to try to say that humanity is better than its reputation. It was incredible what we managed the last 40 years. Just incredible. And the third part of the paper is to do exactly the same the third time, namely to predict what is happening, not what one might wish. And the predictions are, as usual, not quite so rosy. So the question is then how to bring all of this together. So let me now spell out goals. And I do it according to the format, economic, military, political, cultural, social. An economic goal is a minimum income for everybody in the world. A minimum income for everybody in the world. That means sufficient to cover basic needs of food, housing, clothes, and it would mean essentially free health and education services. The goal from a military point of view is to criminalize wars, simply say it's a crime against humanity, and substitute for wars, reconciliation of traumas, and solving conflict. This is today, the world is moving in this direction. We have fewer and fewer areas of tension leading to war. Wars have by and large disappeared between states. There are two states that are keeping out because they see themselves as chosen by their gods and as exceptional. United States of America and Israel. We have problems in connection with those. The third point is political. We have 200 states and 2,000 nations. Nations that have geographical attachment inside those states. That gives us an average of 10 nations per state. Most of the armed conflicts we have in the world are related to that formation. It's the nation versus state. The obvious solution is federation inside states with multiple nations and confederations between states. However, the United Nations is a trade union of governments. And governments have a tendency to opt for unitary states with their control in the hands of the government. In other words, we are in a kind of very difficult situation where a major instrument is inadequate. So that would be an enormous, if you will, step forward, emphasizing federations and confederations. Another word for confederation is community. There are two communities that would be particularly important. One, maybe three. One in Central Asia, one in Northeast Asia, and one in Middle East, perhaps partly North Africa. That would mean Israel, for instance, with six bordering, five bordering Arab countries. Culturally, a dialogue of civilizations the thing that is carried forward so magnificently by this organization. I see six civilizations as particularly important. I mentioned them quickly. Western liberal, Western Marxist, Muslim Islamic, Buddhist, Japanese, and Chinese. The strong point of Western liberal is equality for the law, rule of law, but unfortunately they are focusing only on acts of commission and not on acts of omission. A major fault in Western civilization. Western Marxist. The major point of it being its focus on basic needs, starting with the most needy. 
I do not think we should confuse Western liberal with the United States of America and Western Marxist with the late Soviet Union. We should rather see them as potentials that can be spelled out much further. Islamic civilization enters with two extremely important points, closeness to each other, a we culture, and sharing. And you find it in the five pillars of Islam in different ways expressed. Buddhist civilization enters with neither too much nor too little and space for spiritual growth. Japanese civilization enters with its fantastic talent to overcome unnecessary dichotomies that have been plaguing the West, like the dichotomy between state and capital and between capital and labor. Recently, Japan has been sliding backwards into the U.S. fold, but the civilization still remains as an incredible ability to overcome contradictions. Chinese civilization enters with a major contribution to the economy, copy communism or commune capitalism combining the best of the Marxist point in lifting the bottom up from misery to having basic needs satisfied, liberating hundreds of millions to participation in a capitalist economy. Now, in order to think like that, the Taoist ability to accommodate contradictions and to see the dark and the light points in all of them is absolutely essential. Now, this is much. What did we manage the last 40 years? I think we managed by and large the incredibly. Economically an economy extremely good at producing a variety of goods. The prices per unit of the goods decreasing, but not the prices for the unit of services. So we have, as Professor Bommel points out, the contradiction between services and goods. We managed from the military point of view incredible things. The Cold War ended peacefully. But above all, we managed to get rid of two superpowers. We had a brief period with one superpower. And we now have a situation which is multipolar. And the multipolar poles are Latin America, United States, Russia, India, China, OAC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, European Union, Africa. This is the whole world. And the world is organized to a large extent like this. Politically, we managed the almost incredible. The end of dictatorship in Spain and Portugal, the end of apartheid, the end of the Cold War, without a hot war, as mentioned, the end of dictatorship in socialist, quote-unquote, Europe. We managed all of that, and the beginning of the end of the U.S. empire, following the end of Western colonialism. Now, for humanity to be able to do that within that short span of time is not bad. And I don't think we are good enough to celebrate our achievements. Culturally, we have managed almost the almost incredible. I would point and highlight the Cultural Revolution in China and look at it a little bit differently as an enormous liberation of young people and women and shifting the point of gravity of China away from its location essentially in the eastern part. Culturally, we managed that Western civilization is no longer seen as the only one. That doesn't mean that it is very clear what this dialogue of civilization means. I have mentioned six parties to it. Socially, the feminist revolution, liberating, accelerating the advent of women, 50% of humanity, into all niches of society a gift to a large extent from the United States of America. We managed that, and we managed to stop smoking. 
Now that is quite something. It took 50 years. But if humanity can stop smoking, it may be able to stop using fossil fuels too. Now, I am perfectly aware of the difference that smoking hits the individual. But just wait for some more catastrophes in the wake of fossil fuels, and you'll get a consciousness revolution of the same type. Try to add up what I have said now. It's not bad at all. Not at all. If that could be done, and very much of it was done by common people, and it was not foreseen by experts. I'm responsible for a study made in 1967 to 69, the world in the year 2000. We interviewed 9,000 people in 10 countries around the world. And ordinary people predicted year 2000 much better than experts. The world media would do better having a panel of five regular persons than having experts. Now, an expert is a former pert, which raises the question what the pert is. What are the predictions? I have tried to highlight the triumphs of the peace of the past. I've tried to say something about the future. The predictions are, of course, not so rosy. Enormously increase in inequality. The way capitalism is operating in its present speculative stage, the past investment stage, its, its focus on producing more capital by using capital, not go via production, not going via goods and services, just straight to it, will produce immense inequality. The inequality will produce violent revolutions in one part of the world after the other. It'll be nasty, making the point that control of the economy becomes an absolutely key factor. It's not that difficult. Withdraw your personal account from any bank that invests in speculation and put it into local saving banks. Go from enterprises called companies to cooperatives would help enormously. That movement can be seen in a number of places in the world. It will probably accelerate. Militarily, as I have mentioned, given the problems we have with 1,800 nations against 200 states, terrorism is practically speaking inevitable, and so is state terrorism. Now, the killing ratio between terrorism and state terrorism is about 1 to 99. The terrorists are amateurs, the state terrorists are the professionals. In other words, to move forward with federation as a normal way of organizing a society. And we have 25 major federations in the world, 40% of humanity lives in federations. But only four of them can be said really to address the problem of nations. Switzerland and Belgium in Europe, India and Malaysia in Asia. In other words, there is a large deficit, but also a great space for moving forward. When it comes to the cultural aspect, the interesting thing is, in a sense, the struggle between the two universalizing religions in the world. There are only two of them, Christianity and Islam. So the West is Christianity plus Western Enlightenment, quote-unquote, secularism. Now these two, anybody who can manage any kind of dialogue, trying to see, for each one of them, to see the positive point in the other. And the one who is doing that right now is the present Pope. The present pope is moving in a direction which, from an Islamic point of view, is highly acceptable. Now, socially, we have a number of problems, of course, outstanding. And if I should put a finger on one of them, it would be loneliness. 40% of households in Sweden consist of one person. 
Now, I warn you, if you hear the Norwegian talk about Sweden, don't necessarily trust it. But nevertheless, this seems to be the case. 40% consisting of one person. We are producing societies with lonely individuals who towards the end of their lives live frustrated, traumatized, lonely lives. That, of course, would call immediately for help to the so-called developed countries. And I find Africans extremely resourceful in overcoming loneliness. Now, if I should summarize all of this, I would enter with a guarded optimism. We should be better at appreciating our achievements. We should be better at not only focusing on problems, but also focusing on what we have done. I'm reminded of a certain Mr. Woods, a golf player, who says that I learn more from my best shots than from my poor ones. In other words, going through the successes of the past, what can we learn from it? At the same time, we should not be modest in focusing our goals. And I stop now by repeating them. Point one, a living wage for everybody in the world. Don't worry, human beings are not only homo lunes, not only homo sapiens, they're also homo faber. It's impossible to prevent us from working. Don't worry. Number two, stop wars. Criminalize it. Malaysia is country number one in going out on this one, and the former Prime Minister Mohammed Mahathir has done a fantastic job. Just simply criminalize it. But substitute for its solutions to conflict and reconciliation for traumas. The country that does least in the world in that regard is the United States of America, trying to brush the enormous amount of traumas it has caused on other parts of the world under the carpet. And its ability to solve conflict, instead of that, send the Marines. Now, in the very last weeks and months, they have run up against somebody with a considerably better talent politically. Mr. Putin from Russia, with the idea of instead of blaming one or the other of the parties, getting rid of the chemical arms. Brilliant. It is that kind of creativity that is needed. Now, Mr. Putin knows perfectly well that there are a couple of other arms, not only chemical. In other words, politically, go in for federations and communities, and culturally, the maximum of dialogue, appreciating the good points of everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.